Hi. Today I'm going to be talking about improving eye health through a quantum lens using circadian principles. My name is Dr. Valerie Gian Grandi. I'm an optometrist and I've been in private practice for over 20 years in New York. Over 11 years ago, when my son was four, he started to develop some health issues that just weren't making any sense. And I was getting really frustrated by the pediatricians because they were just throwing prescription medications at the problem and they really weren't helping. And luckily we were able to find some really significant improvements through a functional medicine doctor. And during that time I made so many changes and over time I became more and more holistic. So I wanted to learn more and I became certified as an integrative nutrition health coach, but I was still having some of my own health issues. So I sought the help from my own functional medicine doctor. And as soon as I got there, he said to me, you know, how much sun exposure do you get every day? And I thought he was joking because I am pale. I, I said, you know, I wear my sunglasses all the time. I wear my sunblock. I'm, I'm very protected from the sun. And little did I know that that was one of my biggest problems. So he turned me on to the work of Dr. Jack Cruz and quantum biology. And since then, I've been blown away by these foundational principles. And it turns out that's what was missing from my life. And I realized that it was missing from my life and the life of my family. So since that time, I have been trying to live a quantum life as best as I can living in New York. And I have started to incorporate these principles in practice with patients. So I'm so excited to share this information with you. And I hope that someday everybody starts to understand these foundational principles for health. Okay, so here's a quick overview of what this talk will cover. First, I'm going to go over the principles of quantum biology or circadian biology and explain how important it is. Then I'm going to explain why our modern world is hurting us from a quantum perspective. Next, I'm going to go through all of these eye conditions listed here in detail from a quantum perspective. And finally, I'm going to offer some practical tips that we can incorporate into our daily lives. Okay, so first I'd like to go over sunlight because this is where the story begins. So what is sunlight exactly? Well, sunshine is made up of an entire spectrum of light called the electromagnetic spectrum because each signal from the sun is considered both electrical and magnetic in nature. Now, each ray from the sun has a different wave of energy or wavelength. So when the waves are more powerful, those wavelengths are shorter. The length between the waves are shorter and they have this higher frequency. And when the waves have less electrical energy, the distance between the waves is longer. So they have these longer wavelengths and lower frequency. Now, there's a visible part of the sun that we all know and love. This is our rainbow, our Roy G. Biv. And these are the colors that we understand and that we use every day to decipher the world that we live in. And then there's the invisible part of the spectrum, and this is specifically infrared light and ultraviolet light. Now, infrared light has longer wavelengths and lower frequency or energy than red. And ultraviolet light has these shorter wavelengths and higher frequency, and is therefore considered a higher energy or more powerful than blue or violet. So infrared, visible, and ultraviolet light are considered natural or native to the sun and earth. So from now on, when I talk about full spectrum light, I mean infrared, the colors of the rainbow and ultraviolet light. And as for non-native or more unnatural wavelengths, these are microwaves like our cell phones and radio waves like Bluetooth. Now I will talk about this side of the spectrum because these are the forms of energy that can cause damage to our bodies, especially when we, when we are exposed to them on a regular basis. And unfortunately, since we cannot see or feel these waves or frequencies, we don't even realize what it's doing to our bodies. And these frequencies are getting more and more prevalent each day because technological advances are showing up all the time. Now, it's really important to know that every single wave of light has an energy signal and that it does something different to our biology and the way we function. And that we need the full spectrum of sunlight from infrared to ultraviolet for our bodies to work the way we are designed to be. We're meant to be outside in the sun. So full spectrum sunlight is actually a nutrient for our bodies. Now, I want you to think of light waves as communication signals or Morse codes. So we actually communicate with light in our body and their signals or electrical energy. So again, each wave of sun is like a Morse code for our bodies. So sunlight is responsible for setting our circadian rhythm. Circadian or daily rhythm is the reason why we wake up in the morning and we sleep at night and we do all of our living in between. So what does this look like? Well, when the sun rises, our eyes are wired for this exact signal of light. 
So this means that our naked eyes absorb this perfect amount of light in the morning and the signal gets sent from our eyes to the brain. Now there's an area in the brain called the SCN, the suprachiasmic nucleus, and that's actually our master clock right in the brain. So this clock sets the time for the entire body. Now when the SCN receives this morning light signal, now the brain knows it's morning. And then the SCN will send signals to all other parts of the brain and it wakes us up and starts the day. So this master clock is like the conductor in an orchestra. Now the body needs something that keeps all of our processes working on time. And if there was no master clock keeping everything under control, there would be total chaos in the body. So as I've said before, every function in the body is on a timer and thank goodness, or else we'd be all mixed up. So remember that each wavelength of light has a different amount of energy and it acts like a different signal when we absorb that light through our eyes. So sunrise light is a mix of red and infrared and blue light. And this is the light that tells our brain it's morning, specifically the blue portion of that light. So that blue portion of light helps start the cortisol production in our brains. And this is what wakes us up. And this also starts a cascade of our other hormones. So now our digestive enzymes start to increase, we get hungry and we're ready to start the day. Now red and infrared light signals, they power up our energy cells it lowers inflammation, and they also help us to start absorbing that stronger sun later in the day. Now, once the sun reaches about 10 degrees above the horizon, this is when ultraviolet A light shows up. Now, this is a light that continues to work on our hormones, and this is what runs our entire body. So we make melatonin in response to ultraviolet A light, even though we think of melatonin as a sleep hormone. So it needs to get made during the day, and it gets stored in our brain until nighttime. Now UVA also releases nitric oxide in our skin and this dilates blood vessels. Now our blood cells can rush to the surface and capture these light signals and carry it to the rest of the body. Now what's nice about nitric oxide is that when those blood vessels dilate, blood pressure goes down. And this light also tells our cells to start making melanin and this is the pigmentation in our skin that allows us to tan from those stronger signals of ultraviolet light. And melanin is actually needed throughout the entire body to protect all of our tissues, including blood vessels and brain cells, especially in our eyes. Now, I won't get into all the details about melanin, but just know that it absorbs all frequencies of sunlight safely, and it provides both oxygen and electrons to our mitochondria, which I'll get into in a, in a moment. Now, in the warmer months, when the sun is strong enough, UVB starts to show up, and this is when the sun reaches about 30 degrees above the horizon. Now in New York, this doesn't happen from mid-November till about February, or the end of February. Now ultraviolet B is the light signal that allows us to make vitamin D when it hits our skin. And we all know how important vitamin D is. So when we make vitamin D naturally through our skin, it's made from cholesterol, and this is the most active and helpful form for our bodies. And as a result, cholesterol will go down. And UVB also helps regulate hormones and other processes in the body. It also helps with digestion because it actually improves our gut bacteria. Now, as the sun gets lower in the day, and UVB starts to disappear, and then UVA will disappear, and then we're left with sunset and then darkness. Now, these signals will tell the body it's time to wind down and get ready to rest and repair. Digestive enzymes go down, and we're actually not meant to eat and use up energy to digest our food at night. And now melatonin will get released from the brain, but only when the brain sees about two hours of full darkness. And then we're meant to sleep and the body runs all the programs to rest and repair. So in a nutshell, we run on sun, not on Duncan. <laughs> so the eye itself is actually a hormone making organ. The eye doesn't just have cells that allow us to see, we actually have cells that are waiting for signals of light to stimulate hormone making activity. For instance, we have receptors in the eye called melanopsin. Now, melanopsin are cells that are specifically waiting for blue light. Blue light will signal melanopsin to start that production of cortisol in the brain, and that's what wakes us up and starts that cascade of our other hormones. And there are also receptors for ultraviolet A light, specifically neuropsin and different amino acids. Now, these proteins or amino acids, they're built to capture ultraviolet A light. So when UVA light hits these amino acids, that specific light triggers the production of hormone precursors. And you can see this amazing list of hormones right here. It's almost like a pharmacy in our eyes. So we're talking about hormones that make us happy, that give us energy, that help us sleep at night, 
that help us not get burned from the sun and so much more. So what do you think happens to all these hormones when we never are exposed to full spectrum sunlight in our eyes? So how does this all work? Well, when we talk about light energizing our cells, we're talking about mitochondria. Now, you may remember mitochondria from high school science class as being the powerhouse of our cells because they make ATP. But I really want you to know that mitochondria are so much more than that. They're actually considered their own little organs. They're these organelles and they're found everywhere and they make energy. They look like this. So they have these, uh, they're oval shaped, they have these folds and membranes. And in these membranes, they have proteins and that's how they start making energy. Now, they actually respond to light signals. So in order to work, mitochondria need electrons, oxygen, and light. And some of these electrons come from our food, um, but electrons can also come from the earth and from water and from sunlight. Now, electrons are a form of light signals or electricity, and they have negative charges. Electrons will absorb and release light, and electrons are the power source that flows through the proteins in the membranes. So when they flow through the membranes, it's called the electron transport chain. And I always imagine this mini fireworks show in our bodies as these electrons flow and release light. Um, so they're known for making ATP. Now, because we need mitochondria to make energy, the most mitochondria are found in places that require the most energy, like our heart, our brain, and our eyes, because the eyes are an extension of the brain. So not only is there, this, is, is there a flow of energy, but the mitochondria have the ability to sense the environment around them like an antenna. So the mitochondria know exactly how much energy the body needs at all times. The mitochondria can adapt to stress and toxins and infections and, and whatever's happening. So they're responsible for making sure everything is running smoothly, including our DNA. So I want you to really understand that mitochondria are responsible for running all of our genetic programs. So in medicine, a lot of times we do this genetic testing and we try to look for these particular genes that cause disease. And I'm not saying that this isn't important and that it doesn't play a role in health, but it really is, is truly the mitochondria that can actually turn those genes on and off depending on our environment. And when we think about biochemistry of the body, meaning the way our different hormones or vitamins or nutrients will work on receptors and actually create changes in the body, I want you to understand that it's actually light that is controlling all of that biochemistry. It's the mitochondria. So quantum biology is a much deeper understanding of how our bodies work on an electron or in an electrical level. So light and electricity, that's how we work. Now I have cabinets full of supplements that I've collected over the years. However, the more I learn about quantum biology, I've realized that while nutrients are really important, if our sunlight exposure is lacking, or if we're, we're exposed to the wrong light at the wrong times, none of it really matters because light is actually what's controlling our physiology. Now I did mention ATP, but the mitochondria also make water. And this is perhaps one of the most important things that they do. So the water that's made becomes extremely special water that actually bathes all of our cells and proteins and gives the body its battery power. So if mitochondria don't have the energy required to work, they actually get damaged and that's how we get sick. So we need healthy mitochondria to be healthy. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about that special water that gets made inside of our bodies because it is so important. Now this water is not the same as the water that we drink. When this water comes in contact with any surface in our bodies that's attracted to water, it actually forms a liquid crystal gel. Now, this water is found practically everywhere in our bodies. This gel water will form a battery of negative charge next to positive charge. And that zone of negative charge is referred to as an exclusion zone because it actually pushes or excludes everything larger than an electron out of the area. Now, this battery will act like a highway. And what it does is it transmits electricity at the speed of light throughout the entire body. So I want you to think of energy in the body as voltage or electrical energy. And that's negative energy in the form of electrons and positive energy in the form of protons. And this is how the body communicates through these electrical signals of light everywhere. Now these signals or information, again, they get transmitted at the speed of light. 
So the more of this exclusion zone water we have, the more hydrated we are and the more energy we have to work properly. Now, when we're exposed to infrared light, now infrared light is present in sunlight at all times at 42%. When we're exposed to infrared light, this exclusion zone water gets bigger and stronger and it generates more battery power in the body. Exposure to red light will give the mitochondria more power to work to make more water. And exposure to ultraviolet light will actually generate more electrons in this water. So once again, you can see how important that full spectrum sunlight is. Now, without this water, our cells get dehydrated and we lose energy in the body, including in our collagen network or our fascia, and that's found everywhere. Now, our collagen and our fascia, we require this water to work well. So we need the mitochondria to work well so we can generate more water inside the body. And since we need our mitochondria to work well, we need our circadian rhythm to be set properly by the sun. So I really hope you're starting to see how important it is to get that full spectrum of sunlight through our eyes and our skin. Now I've listed just some of the benefits of that full spectrum sunlight exposure, and I'm not going to read that entire list, but you can see how it covers almost every aspect of our health. Now the sun has actually been shown to reduce all cause mortality. So in other words, regular safe sun exposure has been shown to reduce the risk of death from all these diseases that plague our modern world. So since getting good sunshine throughout the day is how we make that melatonin that gets released at night, I just wanted to go over the importance of melatonin. Sleep is one of the most important ways we can heal. Sleep is literally king. And when we sleep, our melatonin is what allows our mitochondria to repair and heal our cells. So all the cells that were messed up during the day, they're either repaired or they're killed off if they cannot be repaired. Now this includes cancer cells that we all have in our bodies. And sleeping is when we burn fat, it's when we improve our memory, it's when we repair our bodies. And we all know how horrible it feels to function on very little sleep, and we just can't sustain our bodies when we don't have a lot of sleep. And we know that, just, I just want you to know also that taking melatonin as a supplement is really not the same as making it naturally in our bodies. So how does indoor light differ from sunlight? The lights that we're exposed to when we're inside are not the same as the natural sunlight. So here's a comparison between sunlight, which has all the colors of the rainbow, and a typical LED, and these are the most common lights. Now you'll see that these LED lights have this big spike of blue and very little red, and it looks nothing like sunshine. So this spectrum of light does not exist in nature. And we're not designed to look at this foreign signal all day and, light, and night. Now remember that every color of the sun does something different to our biology. And since LEDs are mostly blue, remember that blue light is what turns on the hormone production of cortisol and it starts that hormone cascade when we're exposed to blue in the morning. Well, this signal of blue is the color of the sun at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. So every time our eyes absorb this signal, our brain thinks it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon and, and that's not good. So, Blue light is actually very stimulating. The signal of blue light in our cells is actually a form of oxidative stress. And this stress signal is, is how light communicates in our bodies. But the beautiful thing about blue light when it's, when it's in natural sunshine is that even though blue light causes inflammation signals or, or these oxidative stress signals, it doesn't matter because red light does the opposite. And red light is always present in the sun and red light is the antidote to the blue light inflammation. So it takes care of that inflammation and it doesn't cause damage when we're exposed to blue light outside in the sun. But when we're indoors and we have blue light with no red to balance it out, that constant inflammation becomes a really big problem and it damages our cells, especially in our eyes. Now artificial light will also flicker and this means that those lights turn on and off like a strobe light. And this also doesn't happen with natural sunlight, and this is also very damaging to our cells. So what do you think happens when all we do is see blue all day and all night, and we have no red to balance it out? And there's no infrared light, and there's no ultraviolet light that balances our hormones and tells our body what to do safely. So blue light by itself is not normal, and it's not healthy for our cells. And remember that full spectrum sunlight is a nutrient for our body. But blue light by itself is, is almost like having processed food from a box. 
So now that we know how dangerous artificial blue light is, you might be able to see how it's involved in so many different diseases. So when our bodies think it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon, all day and night, our brains are just set to lunchtime with this, this level of cortisol that's consistent with lunchtime, which is high energy. So imagine now it's eight o'clock at night and the brain is thinking, okay, it's getting late. I'm starting to get tired. I, I should be tired now so my body can sleep. But hey, there's a blue light signal, so it must be 12 o'clock in the afternoon. It must be lunchtime. So now the body will release more cortisol to give us that energy and make us hungry. Now, cortisol increases blood sugar and it increases insulin. And cortisol contributes to poor immune responses and it keeps us stressed, right? Cortisol messes with estrogen and our other hormones. And cortisol can mess with our brains and it keeps us anxious and wired. So when there's only blue and there's no other light signals to help us process these hormones and get rid of them, now we're wired at the wrong time. And now melatonin can't be released from the brain because we think it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon and we can't sleep even if we're tired. So melatonin can't be released if cortisol is high. So are you starting to see how this can cause trouble? Here are just some of the health issues that are caused by artificial blue light, especially at night. And you can see this wide range of issues from diabetes to autoimmunity to weight gain and to cancer and even neurodegeneration. Now, this research is so powerful, and I just think it's crazy that this isn't known to be a really big health risk, even if we actually try to eat healthy. So what's wrong with our modern world? Well, what happens on a typical day? What do we do? We wake up in the morning, we turn on our lights and our TVs and our phones. And then perhaps we're sitting in front of screens all day. We're at work in our offices or we're at home working from home or we're in school. And then when we do go outside, we're wearing sunglasses and that blocks the full spectrum of light. We're surrounded by these Wi-Fi signals all day and these artificial lights. We're eating at all times of the day, including after dark. And then after dark, we keep on our lights and our TVs and our phones. And we're just exposed to these artificial lights all day and all night. And some of us may not even see the sun at all because we wake up early, we get to work before the sun comes up and we come home and it's dark. So we're completely out of sync with nature and our bodies have no idea what time it really is. And I hope you can see that that's a really big problem for, for the health of our bodies. So now I'd like to go into each condition in a little more detail. And I'm going to start with dry eyes because it's one of the most common conditions that I see every day. So as you can see, our tear film is made up of three different parts. We have mucus, water, and oil. We have goblet cells that secrete mucus. We have lacrimal glands that make water. And we have these oil glands called mybobian glands in the eyelids. And they pump out oil every time we blink. And this is what keeps our tears from evaporating. Now our tear film is meant to stay in place for about 10 seconds. And after 10 seconds, those tears will start to break up. And that's when we automatically blink like a windshield. And this helps to reestablish those beautiful three layers. And it helps us maintain this clear and comfortable vision. So dry eyes will occur when one or all of these layers are disrupted. And if the ocular surface is no longer nourished the way it's supposed to be. So the tears can break up too quickly, either because the oil glands are clogged and they can't release enough of that healthy oil or the lacrimal glands are not making enough water, or those goblet cells are making either too much mucus or not enough mucus. So when dry eyes occur, people start to complain of this redness or tearing. They're really irritated, they feel scratchy, they feel pain, their vision can be blurry throughout the day. And sometimes they can even get these headaches, which is referred pain. So when the cornea is exposed to air from a poor tear film, those nerve endings can fire and create pain that creates headaches. And then some people also complain of light sensitivity as well. So under the microscope, it can look something like this. Um, we use this yellow dye called fluorescein, and this yellow dye will glow under a cobalt blue light. So the yellow dye will stain all of those surface cells that are damaged or dehydrated. So the areas that are glowing are actually dried out. And you can see these diffuse spots that are glowing on the cornea and also some areas on the white part of the eye that are glowing, and that's on the conjunctiva, and those cells are glowing due to dryness. So while there may be other causes of dry eyes, I'm only going to concentrate on the quantum causes. So first is poor circadian rhythm. 
So remember when that, that we chronically, when we chronically miss that morning sunshine and sunshine throughout the day, we just don't have the proper hormones or the proper energy that we need to really stay healthy and hydrated. And remember that the eyes are a hormone making organ and we have those UVA receptors called neuropsin. They're actually on the cornea. So in other words, we need some UVA light to be absorbed, as I explained earlier, as I explained earlier, to make hormones and energy for our body through our eyes. And without that UVA and full spectrum sunlight, this can lead to different health issues like hormonal dysfunction. Now, hormonal dysfunctions play a really large role in how our glands function, including the oil glands in our lids, the glands that make water, and those goblet cells that secrete mucus. And those, those, all those cells have clock genes, and they require proper timing and proper hormonal signals to work well. And also, poor circadian rhythm can contribute to that long list of health issues like diabetes and cardiovascular disease and autoimmune issues. Now, these conditions will ultimately lead to inflammation and prescription medications. Now, most, if not all, prescriptions can disrupt the tear film in some way, and many have dry eyes as a side effect. Now, inflammation from those health issues is also linked to dry eyes and results in this poor water production from those lacrimal glands. Now, poor circadian rhythm will also contribute to low melatonin and poor sleep quality. So if we don't sleep, our tear film cannot be replenished. So I'm sure you've noticed how dry and heavy the eyes feel if you get a really bad night of sleep or if someone wakes you up in the middle of the night. Now, next is blue light toxicity. So again, when we're exposed to blue light all day, it can also contribute to dry eyes. So remember that artificial blue light when it's unbalanced by red is oxidizing and damaging. Now this dehydrates our bodies and it messes with our mitochondria and the cornea is full of collagen. And remember that collagen needs to be hydrated in order to function properly. So dehydrated collagen will lead to cells that are damaged. And when cells are dehydrated due to blue light and Wi-Fi signals and this poor mitochondrial function and a lack of red and infrared light, not only does our collagen get dehydrated, but our lymph flow is also affected. And our lymph flow can be adversely affected and actually get stagnant. Now the conjunctiva requires good lymph flow to get rid of these toxins that build up. So if lymph flow is stagnant, the eyes are irritated and they get full of toxins. Now, there are also vitamin D receptors and melatonin receptors in nearly every part of the eye, including our cornea, our conjunctiva, and our lids. Now, low vitamin D levels will contribute to the poor functioning of those cells, as do low melatonin levels. Now, there's also a microbiome in our eyes, just like we have good bacteria in our guts and on our skin. So we require that good circadian rhythm and this healthy immune system and full spectrum light to maintain this adequate microbiome. Now, overall, our eyes require mitochondria to function well, right? So mitochondrial cells are found in all parts of the eye. And when mitochondrial cells get damaged, the optimal functioning of those cells goes down. Now, it's just a side note on photophobia. I'm noticing that more and more people are super sensitive to light. Now, this is also a function of blue light toxicity. So when the eyes are cooked by artificial light all night and day, there's this constant signal going to the brain that affects our pupil. So our pupil can no longer respond to light the way it's supposed to. And this has to do with too much stimulation of that sympathetic or that fight or flight pathway in the brain. And that's what controls the pupil's response to light. So the pupil, due to the stress, it, it can no longer constrict or it doesn't close well enough when the light hits it. And as a result, sunlight is really bothersome. So we need that pupil to control the amount of light or sunshine that we get. And that's why when we dilate eyes during an eye exam, the sun hurts because there's this excess glare because the eyes can no longer constrict. So allergic conjunctivitis is another issue that I see regularly. When people are suffering from allergies in their eyes, they usually complain of this intense itching and redness. They have watery eyes. Sometimes they get this mucus film on their eyes and their eyelids might also be swollen or red. And usually it is in both eyes and it can be seasonal and, and they're just really uncomfortable. So under the microscope, we see these tiny little bumps called papillae. You can see that right here. 
And these are mast cells that release histamine and other chemicals that actually contribute to the symptoms of allergies. And sometimes the conjunctiva is swollen as well, and you can see that in this photo. So what are some of the quantum causes? So once again, circadian disruption plays a really large role in how the immune system works. So an overactive immune system can contribute to allergies and mast cells are related to immune dysfunction, mast cell issues. And mast cells are also controlled by clock genes, just like the rest of our bodies. Now, histamine release is also associated with cellular dehydration. So remember that when our cells get dehydrated, and this is when we have too much blue light, too much Wi-Fi, when we're lacking red light and infrared light, or when the mitochondria are not working, um, the exclusion zone water is not made that well and our cells get dehydrated and our body will actually release histamine as a result of that dehydration. And this will make allergies worse. Now, this dehydration will also reduce the ability of lymph to flow in the body. Now remember that conjunctiva are full of lymph tissues and, and we require this good flow to help reduce the oxygen and the toxins. So the inability to clean out our cells overnight contributes to this toxin buildup and this can increase the burden on our immune system and this can make allergies worse. Now, low vitamin D and low melatonin also affect the function of these cells. So again, there are VDR or vitamin D receptors and melatonin receptors everywhere. And melatonin is not only active at night, um, melatonin also gets made locally during the day and it acts like an antioxidant. And then we have our low pineal melatonin and this is what gets released at night. This causes poor sleep, this disrupts our immune system, and this also makes allergies worse. Now again, if there are disruptions in our microbiome, this can also have a negative effect on our immune cells that are found in the conjunctiva. And remember that our microbiome is affected by ultraviolet light. Now a lack of red and infrared light will also reduce our mitochondrial capacity to work well. And overall, mitochondrial dysfunction leads to poor cellular function. And the mitochondria are full of my, are, the conjunctiva, excuse me, are full of mitochondria. So next up is myopia or nearsightedness. Myopia is the inability to see clearly in the distance. And so many children have myopia. They'll come in squinting because they can no longer see the board in school. So what is it exactly? Well, when light comes into the eye from a distance, it actually focuses in front of the retina and you can see that right here. So the retina does not get a, an image that is in focus because the light is too far in front of the retina. And this can happen when the eyeball gets too long so that the light physically cannot reach the back of the eye. Now this blur will tend to get worse and worse every year and it gets treated with glasses or contacts or LASIK. Now there are risks involved if the eyes are too myopic because as the eyeball gets longer and longer, the retinal cells can get stretched out and there's actually risks for retinal detachments and for central macular thinning and, and risks for glaucoma. Now, all of these conditions can lead to a permanent loss of vision. And also the quality of life is decreased when vision is really poor because we have to rely on these glasses or contacts just to function. So I am going to go over some of the quantum causes. Now, a lack of full spectrum sunlight, specifically UVB light, will lead to vitamin D deficiency. And many studies are showing that low levels of vitamin D are actually implicated in this myopia progression. Now, most importantly, dopamine, which remember is made in the eye from that UVA light, it has been shown to regulate the growth of the eyeball. So a lack of UV light will lower dopamine. Now, blue light toxicity will also lower levels of dopamine because it activates an enzyme called MAOB, and that also lowers dopamine. Now, low dopamine has been linked to this abnormal growth of the eyeball, which makes the eyeball lo longer, and that's one of the main causes of myopia. Now this has to do with dopamine regulating our skeletal muscles. So when the eyeball muscles, which are skeletal, when they lose proper functioning, the eyeball can grow abnormally because those muscles are no longer holding its proper shape. Now, there are also studies showing that allergic conjunctivitis and mast cell activation, that, that may also contribute to myopia as well. And we already heard about the quantum causes of that issue. And, it has actually been well known for some time, for a while now, 
that children who spend more time outside in the sunlight have this lower incidence of myopia. So I don't know if these researchers actually are actually aware of these quantum benefits of that full spectrum sunlight, like on this electron level, but they have been able to make that connection that sunlight really does lower the risk of myopia. So the next common issue is cataracts. So there are different types of cataracts, but a cataract is essentially a cloudy lens. And the lens here is right behind the iris, and it's made up of these collagen fibers with no blood vessels. And those collagen fibers are lined up so that they remain super clear so that obviously light can flow through it. And over time, those collagen fibers can get oxidized or damaged or cloudy, and then vision gets blurry. And eventually the lens will need to be removed and it, gets, it has to be replaced with the clear lens in order to see clearly. Now this is associated with aging. However, these days I have noticed that cataract formation is actually happening in much younger populations than it has in the past. Now, people will complain of glare and blur. Sometimes it's worse at different times of the day. Um, colors can get dim. Glasses no longer work well. And sometimes they need more light to read. And a lot of people can no longer drive at night. Now, what are some of the common uh, quantum causes? So once again, circadian disruption will lead to those health problems that can promote inflammation in the body. Now, inflammation will make cataract formation worse and health problems can also lead to prescription medications. And again, prescriptions are full of side effects. And some of those medications can have an effect on collagen clarity and elasticity. Now, some issues in particular like diabetes are associated with faster cataract formation. And also people who take steroids to treat their autoimmune conditions, um, including people who have asthma and use inhalers, they tend to get cataracts much faster along the back surface of that lens. Now, the outer layer is full of mitochondria, the outer layer of the lens. And again, when mitochondria are dysfunctional, this will contribute to this oxidative stress and it can damage the tissue, which weakens the integrity of those cells. And this also changes the oxygen gradient in the lens and creates damage. Now, once again, we're not meant to be exposed to this harsh blue light all day and all night. And it's damaging and oxidizing. So the body tries really hard to protect itself and the lens has to absorb light before it hits the retina. So these collagen fibers are really susceptible to damage and the lens will become cloudy and yellow in an attempt to shield the retina from this harsh blue light. Now, blue light, when, it, when we're lacking that red and infrared light, also dehydrates our cells and it decreases that exclusion zone water and eventually it creates this dehydration of our collagen. Now remember, our collagen requires this exclusion zone water to remain hydrated and to work properly. Now, most people wear sunglasses all the time. And, and what does that do? It blocks our full spectrum of light. And again, we need that full spectrum of light to balance our blue and to set our circadian rhythm. Now, red light has also been shown to be protective against cataracts. So there are some studies that show that too much infrared light or too much heat it can contribute to cataracts, but this is found mostly in welders. This is not true of the general population. And UV light has also been notoriously blamed for cataract formation. Now, it is true that excessive ultraviolet light exposure can contribute to cataracts, but most people are no longer in situations where they're exposed to this strong UV light all day long. Now, for people who are exposed to these high levels of UV light for long periods of time, then of course it can be a, a factor in the cataract formation. But in our modern world, most people here do not fall into that category. And safe, full spectrum sun exposure is really beneficial. Now, a lack of sleep from low melatonin will also indirectly affect our health. And again, this leads to this worsening of conditions that can contribute to cataract formation. And finally, that lack of sun or UVB light will cause low vitamin D. And, and we know that low vitamin D contributes to many health issues as well. And those health issues can also make cataracts worse. So next are floaters. So what are floaters? Well, we have this ball of jelly inside of our eyes called the vitreous. And this jelly is made up of collagen, hyaluronic acid, and water. 
Now, over time, the hyaluronic acid can liquefy and then those collagen fibers will get separated. And these separate fibers will clump together and they get denser and they can start to float around this ball of jelly like a snow globe. Now, as these fibers float past the retina, they, they can cast shadows in the vision. And that's when you can see these spots or these hairs or lines that are floating around and they really bother people. There are no conventional treatments for basic floaters. Now there are some risks with floaters. So this ball of jelly is actually very sticky and it can sometimes pull away from the retina and, and this can create flashes of lights. And as it's pulling away, it can cause either retinal holes or retinal tears or even retinal detachments. Now, this is what it can look like under the microscope. So you can see that these fibers here are creating shadows on the retina. And these are actually floating in front of the retina. And, and when they float by, they, ca they cast shadows in the visual field. So quantum causes are similar, and I hope you're starting to see a pattern here. So we have blue light toxicity. This special collagen gel of the vitreous, it's designed to slow down light before it hits the retina. And again, blue light is stronger and more powerful, especially when it's unbalanced. So this will create oxidative stress and dehydration. Now, the vitreous has to absorb that excess energy and it ultimately it can get dehydrated and floaters can form more easily. Circadian disruption can also lead to mitochondrial dysfunction and ultimately oxidative stress as well as cellular dehydration. So studies show that this increase in reactive oxygen species actually contributes to this liquefying of collagen and hyaluronic acid. Now that lack of red light and infrared light, also Wi-Fi exposure and blue light, these all contribute to that cellular dehydration and that leads to collagen dehydration. And remember that cellular dehydration will also lead to poor lymph flow. Now, research from Dr. Jerry Tennant, who's an ophthalmologist, he shows that the vitreous will actually hold on to toxins from our lymphatic flow. And he says that poor lymph flow will create this buildup of toxins and then floaters can also form more easily. And floaters are also more common in people with myopia due to the stretching of the eyeball, which stretches this viscoelastic ball of jelly, and it can disrupt the, the matrix of the vitreous. And we know that myopia also has its own quantum causes as discussed previously. Okay, we have macular degeneration. So the macula or the fovea is the center of the eye with the highest concentration of photoreceptors and no blood vessels. So this is where light focuses and this is where we see the most detail. This is actually what's responsible for our detailed central vision. In dry macular degeneration, the cells can get damaged and they start to leak drusen, which are lipids. And this destroys the architecture of the cells that we need to see right in the center of our eyes. Now, if too much of that drusen leaks out of our cells, the retinal pigment epithelial cells, they can crack. And then fluid or blood can actually get trapped in the center of the eye. And this really disrupts vision. And this is called wet macular degeneration. And this is where people lose central vision. Um, they can no longer read clearly. They can't drive. They can't see people's faces. Um, glasses don't help. I mean, this can be really devastating. And once those cells are scarred, they typically don't get better. Now you can see on the bottom left what this looks like on an OCT image, which is this cross section of the macula. So here in this top image, this shows a normal macula, which is, and you see this smooth dip, and that's the fovea. And you can see how tightly those cells are lined up in these beautiful layers. Now, the middle image shows a disruption of the architecture, and you see these bumps um, underneath, and these are drusen. And you can see it's starting to disrupt the cells in the macula. Now, in the bottom image, um, you can see that fluid here has gotten trapped. And this is what causes more damage to the architecture of those cells. And this will eventually lead to scar tissue as it gets worse. Now, what are the quantum causes? Now, once again, circadian disruption will lead to mitochondrial dysfunction. And I want you to know that those retinal cells are packed with mitochondria. So anything that will disrupt mitochondria will damage and disrupt the macula, which contributes to vision loss. So mitochondrial dysfunction will cause a lot of this oxidative stress and this is what damages the cells in an area that requires a lot of this blood flow and oxygen. Now, I said that the macula doesn't have any blood vessels, so the macula will get its blood supply from the choroid. 
Now the choroid is this really dense vascular layer and it's underneath the retina, it's right here. And you can see it in the OCT. Now mitochondrial dysfunction will also contribute to health issues that affect cardiovascular function and oxygen flow. So macular degeneration tends to be worse in people with these inflammatory conditions and cardiovascular disease. Now, blue light toxicity is perhaps one of the biggest contributing factors to macular degeneration. So when blue light actually hits a photoreceptor, it separates vitamin A. Now this free form of vitamin A is actually super toxic to our cells and it causes significant damage. And DHA, which are our healthy fat cells, DHA is also damaged by blue light. So the cells end up getting leaky and this causes those lipid deposits to clog up the cells and cause central vision loss. Now when blue light is balanced by red light and the natural sunlight, this damage is protected because remember red light is the antidote to blue light inflammation, but artificial blue light is what causes damage. Now blue light will also contribute to this low oxygen status in the mitochondria. Now this disrupts the energy flow in the mitochondria and that also leads to damage. Now a lack of UVA light will cause a decrease in nitric oxide. And remember that nitric oxide dilates blood vessels and it improves blood flow and nutrient flow and oxygen flow. So when UV light is lacking, this doesn't happen. So then there's this poor blood flow and a lack of nutrients. And then the choroid is not able to deliver the proper nutrients and the proper oxygen to the macula when those nitric oxide levels are low. Now, also remember that the eye is that hormone making organ and UV light is how melanin or pigmentation starts getting made. So a lack of UV light will lower melanin production. Now the eye requires a ton of melanin in the retinal pigments epithelial layer. This is a really important layer of the retina. The retinal pigment epithelial layer is what gives the macular cells its nutrients and it also helps to regenerate or clean up those waste products like drusen from the photoreceptors. And melanin is also, it also absorbs excess heat and energy from the light that's being transmitted through the retina. This is all accomplished by melanin. So when melanin is decreased, the macular cells get damaged because those byproducts, that drusen will start to build up. And a lack of red light will also contribute to poor mitochondrial function and, and less of that exclusion zone water. Now cellular dehydration is a lack of electrical current or voltage. And remember we need a really high voltage that's needed in the retina because we need this uh, exclusion zone water. We need a ton of exclusion zone water where we need this high energy or voltage because there is an intense amount of energy that we need to absorb and process light all day long. Now, Blue light will also contribute to cellular dehydration, as does Wi-Fi, and a lack of infrared light also contributes to dehydration. Now, finally, low vitamin D will contribute to diseases that can make macular degeneration worse, and there are vitamin D receptors in the retina. Now, a lack of sleep is also implicated in overall health, but most importantly, Melatonin is needed to regenerate our retinal cells. It regenerates our cones overnight. So we really need good sleep and adequate melatonin to perform all of these functions. So next is diabetic retinopathy. Now, elevated blood sugar can damage those tiny blood vessels on the retina and they can start to leak fluids. And a lack of oxygen from this elevated blood sugar can also stimulate new blood vessels to form but unfortunately, those new blood vessels that grow are very weak and they're leaky and they can rupture. Now you can see in this picture on the right, some of the ways that those blood vessels can leak. Um, there can be lipid leakage, uh, there can be dot and blot hemorrhages, cotton wool spots here, and that's from a lack of oxygen. And there, there can be microaneurysms, and again, that new blood vessel formation. Now, unfortunately, there typically are no symptoms of diabetic retinopathy, you know, unless that, fluid le unless that fluid leakage appears right in the center of the eye. And you can see what that looks like in the cross section of the OCT here. So when fluid leaks right in the center of the eye, that's called diabetic macular edema, and that can cause some blur. Now, other symptoms can also occur, but typically only in very late stages of diabetic retinopathy. Now, the quantum causes for diabetic retinopathy are pretty straightforward because 
we know that circadian disruption and blue light at night does increase the risk for diabetes, that cortisol release will increase blood sugar and insulin. And we already know the other issue with blue light on the retina, that blue light is physically toxic to those retinal cells, as I mentioned earlier with macular degeneration. Now also, low melatonin is a problem because melatonin is required to regenerate our retinal cells overnight. And low vitamin D is also detrimental to the functioning of our retina. That lack of sleep is also detrimental to our healing and our overall health. And lack of sleep will contribute to weight gain, which also increases cortisol and can make diabetes worse. And once again, we know that a lack of red and infrared light will contribute to poor mitochondrial function and cellular dehydration. Now this reduces that exclusion zone water and the voltage or that battery power that we need to keep electricity flowing through our retina. Now a lack of that exclusion zone water will contribute to a lack of nutrients and, and oxygen and blood flow. And of course, dehydration um, also comes from blue light and Wi-Fi. And infrared light is needed to regenerate our photoreceptor rod cells during the day. Now, once again, a lack of ultraviolet light will lead to that lower nitric oxide release. And again, that reduces our blood flow and nutrients and oxygen due to that, that poor vessel dilation. And a lack of that UV light will also lower melanin production. And then, as I mentioned before, I mean, the eyes require a ton of melanin in that retinal pigment epithelial layer. And this is what keeps our retinal cells healthy. Now, melanin will help absorb oxidative damage and it helps to recycle our cells. Melanin also keeps oxygen flowing and melanin will also protect the retina from new blood vessel formation. So melanin is crucial to the functioning of that retinal pigment epithelial layer, which is crucial to the functioning of our retina. Now, finally, our retinal cells are full of mitochondria, as I said before. So when they become damaged in this setting of elevated blood sugar, it has been shown to accelerate our cell death in these, in these tiny retinal capillaries. Next is glaucoma. So there are many different types of glaucoma, but today I'm just going to concentrate on the open angle, high pressure form of glaucoma. So we have this water pressure in the eye and, and there's this constant current of fluid that gets made here by these ciliary body cells and, and it flows through this current, through this canal in front of the iris. Now, when the eye pressure stays too high, it can actually cause damage to the optic nerve by pushing on the optic nerve, it pushes on those nerve cells. And this reduces the amount of nutrients and oxygen that the nerve tissue gets. And this can lead to this ganglion cell or nerve cell death. Now, over time, this damage can lead to tunnel vision and it can eventually lead to blindness. So unfortunately, there are no symptoms of glaucoma unless it's advanced. And you can see in this middle photo here, the difference between a healthy optic nerve with pink rim tissue and the damage that starts to occur um, as nerve cells die. So there's this loss of pink rim tissue and the center or the cup of the nerve gets larger and larger in this certain pattern until eventually there are no cells left and there's this complete atrophy of the disc and you can see that disc is, is just gone. Now, the quantum causes are similar. Circadian disruption, again, will lead to health issues that can affect blood flow like hypertension and diabetes and sleep apnea. So the optic nerve requires a lot of oxygen and nutrients, I mean, it's brain tissue. So anything that disrupts flow can affect nerve cells. And even migraines, which are related to blood flow changes can be a risk factor for glaucoma as well. Now, a lack of melatonin has actually been shown to be extremely disruptive to the optic nerve. And many studies are now linking low melatonin to worse outcomes of glaucoma. And it makes sense because melatonin will protect our nerve tissue while we sleep, and it helps us maintain these healthy cells. And melatonin is also an antioxidant. And remember, we also make me local melatonin in the mitochondria during the day, and this will act as an antioxidant, in addition to the melatonin that gets stored in our brains for sleep and helps repair our bodies overnight. A lack of red light will also contribute to a lack of that local nitric oxide that we actually make in the mitochondria. So this will release, uh, reduce the amount of water and ATP that get made by the mitochondria. 
and this reduces the ability of the mitochondria to function optimally. Now, once again, nerve cells are full of mitochondria since it re they require this intense amount of energy. Now, when UVA light is lacking, again, there's this low nitric oxide, which is this lack of vessel dilation, and a lack of vessel dilation will create less blood flow and less oxygen flow and, and less nutrient delivery to the optic nerve. There are lots of recent studies that are actually trying to use nitric oxide as this treatment for glaucoma. So they actually did add nitric oxide to, to one of the eye drops that we use to treat glaucoma. Now, when vitamin D is low, our nerve cells are not protected. There are VDR or vitamin D receptors in optic nerve cells, and, and that's also required for the optimal functioning of our nerve cells. Now, cellular dehydration from this blue light toxicity, from Wi-Fi signals, from a lack of red and infrared light, and from mitochondrial dysfunction all contribute to this poor energy flow, which is essentially low voltage. Now, this will also lead to poor lymph flow. So Dr. Jerry Tennant, once again, he has a really interesting way of looking at glaucoma. So he talks about poor lymph flow contributing to glaucoma. And he says that when lymph doesn't flow properly, there's this buildup of toxins that flow into the vitreous. And remember, the vitreous is that area that has those floaters. Now, he says that this lymph needs to flow out of the eye through lymph vessels or this canal near the iris. And when lymph is stagnant, those toxins build up and flow is blocked. And this will ultimately lead in an increase in pressure builds up. And this increase in pressure and toxins is what damages the optic nerve cells. And this is what causes cell death. So the conventional world does not think of glaucoma in this way at all. It's treated with eye drops to lower the pressure. There are some other treatments, but we usually start with eye drops to lower the pressure. So Dr. Tennant feels that lowering the pressure will reduce the ability of that lymph to flow which increases this toxic burden and stagnation and makes it worse. And this can explain why like, over time, most patients will end up needing more and more drops to lower the pressure because one drop will stop working and then we just have to keep adding more and more drops over time. So it's a really interesting way of looking at glaucoma. Okay, so now that we know how dangerous it is to have poor circadian rhythm or poor quantum health, what are some of the things we can do to optimize our circadian rhythm? Well, perhaps the most important thing we can do is to get morning sunshine to start every day. So what does this look like? Well, I'm not suggesting that you drive to the beach and watch sunrise every morning. I realize that that's not practical or possible for any of us. Um, but what you can do is just go outside and face the direction of the sun with naked eyes. And even if it's just for five minutes, even if it's a cloudy day or a rainy day, we still need that signal in our naked eyes. Now, if you can't do that, you can open a window in your house. Now, you need to physically open the window, not just our shades, because modern, modern windows will block the full spectrum of sun, and so the window, the window has to physically be opened. Now, if you're on your way to work already and you're in the car, you can crack open your car window. Um, you can go for a walk. Now, if you do wake up before sunrise, you wanna to try to wear blue light blockers until you see the sun because you, you don't want artificial blue light to be the first signal, but I'll talk about that more in a moment. Now remember, do not wear sunglasses or contacts or glasses. We need naked eyes to get these benefits. And we can also try to ground if possible, and I'll talk about that again in a moment. And also you wanna to try to eat after you see sunrise because remember that every function in the body is on a timer and this includes digestion. So if we chronically eat before we see sunrise, we are disrupting that circadian rhythm as well. So next, we wanna to try to get as much sun as we possibly can throughout the day. Now, I know that we don't all have time to spend six hours outside every day, um, but we can try to get more sunshine in, in little pieces throughout the day. So if you're working, why not take small sun breaks throughout the day, right? People take cigarette breaks. Why not get a five minute sun break without sunglasses just a few times a day? And again, don't look directly at the sun. That's not what I'm saying, but we do need that naked, those naked eyes to get those benefits. Um, you can also go for walks outside at different times during the day. Now, getting outside when that ultraviolet A light is rising, remember at that 10 degree mark, this is really so helpful because remember those hormones that we make in response to UVA in our naked eyes. And remember that our eyes are a hormone-making organ. 
So I sound like a broken record, but really no glasses, no sunglasses, no contacts. Now, if you're indoors, perhaps you can open your windows in the house or in your car or in your office. Um, if you're a teacher, maybe you could open the windows in your classroom th throughout the day. Now, we also want to try to make vitamin D in that middle of the day when the UVB is present. Again, this only happens certain times of the year, and this does have to be done safely. I'll get into that in a moment. Now, sunset is another time um, that would really help the body start to relax. Now, if you exercise, um, you really want to try to do it outside if it's possible. So if you're exercising in a gym, just remember that you're under these artificial blue lights and that artificial blue light contributes to that increasing cortisol, as does exercise. And this is especially important um, if you're somebody who wakes up before sunrise and goes to the gym. Now, that exposure to artificial blue light before sunrise, especially while you're exercising, can be really disruptive to your circadian rhythm and overall health. I know that might not be a popular opinion, but it, it really does play a role. So we've been taught that the sun is dangerous, right? The sun causes skin cancer. The sun has to be blocked at all costs. We have to wear our sunglasses all the time. We need sunblock at all times. Now, I mean, these are the messages that I've been taught, and these are the messages that I truly believed until I found out how important circadian rhythm and sunlight really is. Now, that being said, obviously there is truth in the fact that too much sun can be damaging. And again, too much sun at the wrong time can also be damaging. So it can be damaging if you're someone who's inside all week and then you go and spend hours at the beach in a bikini like on a tropical island and you get burned. Like obviously that's not the best approach. Um, but just a side note that research on melanoma is actually showing that it's it, not necessarily related to UV damage, it's inversely related to our vitamin D levels. And how do we make vitamin D? We make vitamin D from sun exposure, and that a lot of melanoma is found in places that are not even exposed to ultraviolet light. And research that's done on ultraviolet light being dangerous has always been done with artificial ultraviolet lamps and not with full spectrum light. Now, I'm not saying that ultraviolet light does, you know, doesn't cause skin cancer because, of course, there, there is that link. Um, but the benefits of sun really do outweigh the, the risks of, of some of those skin cancers, not melanoma. Um, so. When this is done the right way, our bodies have these built-in protection mechanisms to help us absorb the sun in the right way. And the key is that we have to build up slowly. So we wanna let our bodies get used to these less powerful parts of the sun before we spend hours outside in the middle of the day when that UVB is really high. So by absorbing more of that red light and infrared light in the morning from that early morning sun, our body has the ability to actually absorb more of that stronger UV light later in the day. So we have these built-in mechanisms. So what does this look like? Well, for sunrise, um, at a minimum, you really wanna try to get five to 10 minutes at a minimum, again, through those naked eyes, and that's what helps set our tone. And we can also get our skin exposed because again, this helps to build our skin protection against that stronger UV later in the day. Now, again, as that sun rises and ultraviolet A light shows up, it's still very mild ultraviolet light, um, but this is really a benefit for us. This helps us absorb more UV later. And again, 20 minutes at a minimum is really helpful to get that UVA light in our eyes and our skin if possible. Now, in the middle of the day, um, at certain times of the year, this is when that UVB shows up. And again, this is when we make vitamin D. This timing does depend. Um, you should be getting about 20 minutes at a minimum, but again, this does depend on your skin tone, on how much light you've been absorbing earlier in the day. Now, you have to get skin exposure to make vitamin D. This doesn't, this doesn't happen through our naked eyes. And the more skin exposure we get, the better. Now, we do wanna start slow and we wanna look for redness. Now, remember I said that that ultraviolet light will dilate our blood vessels. And when those vessels dilate, the, um, the red blood cells will rush to the surface of our skin to absorb that ultraviolet light. And when those vessels dilate, we get this red, this erythema response. It, it's just that redness. And this isn't sunburn. This is just our vessels that are dilating to try to absorb that light. And you know that it's not sunburn because it doesn't last that long. But we can use that to, to let our bodies know when we've already had enough of that sun. And that's how we can build up tolerance to that stronger UVB. Now, I also wanna make a note that if we are trying to make vitamin D and we're wearing sunglasses, this is what contributes to our skin burning. So our eyes have to have the same timestamp as our skin to generate vitamin D. 
So when we're wearing sunglasses, our body thinks it's nighttime. So the brain will not upregulate the skin to safely make vitamin D and our skin will burn a lot quicker. So again, we don't wanna look directly at the sun, but we also cannot be wearing sunglasses if we're trying to make vitamin D. Um, what you can do, and this is what I do, you can download this app called the D Minder app. It's the letter D Minder. And this will help you make vitamin D without burning. It's, it's really helpful. I use, it, I use it all summer, I love it. Now, um, the other thing to, to keep in mind is that when we use sunblock, sunblock will actually block ultraviolet B. So we literally cannot make vitamin D when we're wearing sunblock. So what I do, um, instead of putting on sunblock, if I think I've had too much sun, I will, I'll wear a hat, I'll go under an umbrella, or I'll put on clothes. I typically try to avoid sunblock. And again, I won't wear sunglasses when I'm trying to make vitamin D, when I'm getting that UVA exposure, morning light. And especially since I'm not outside that much, I typically don't wear sunglasses um, a lot because I want to get those signals in my eyes. Um, so those are the times that I don't wear it. And then again, at the end of the day, we have sunset and 10 minutes at a minimum is, is also very helpful. Of course, longer is better. Um, so, um, because it, it's really healing to the body and it actually helps our body start getting ready for bedtime. So this next step is really important. We have to block our artificial blue light, especially at night. So there's a big difference between blocking blue light during the day and blocking light at night. And remember that blue light tells the brain it's daytime and gives us energy. So it doesn't make sense to block 100% of that blue light during the day because we want the brain to know it's nighttime. So during the day, you can wear these daytime blue light blockers and day blue blockers are typically very light yellow or even lighter. And um, you wanna wear these indoors only when you're on screens or just indoors in general. Now, if you, if you can't do that, you can download this program called Iris Technology or F-Lux. And this will change the monitor settings to mimic the sun and actually reduce that blue light exposure. Now, you should also try to keep your phones on that night shift setting or blue blocker setting all day. And at night, you almost wanna put, you wanna put them on red light setting because that night shift setting is really only blocking 50% of that blue light, even when it's on maximum setting. Now, once the sun is set, we do wanna to try to limit our electronics. We wanna put our phones in that airplane mode or again, turn them off. And at night, when that sun is down, you should be wearing these um, orange toned or red toned glasses. So these are mine. These glasses block 100% of blue light because again, blue light does not exist at night and we need to block all of it. So yes, does it make everything a little orange? Of course. Is it annoying to watch TV and not see any blue? Yes. But when you remember that long list of health issues that are related to that artificial light, especially at night, it is well worth a little bit of orange uh, tint to things. So the other thing we want to do is just turn down our overhead lights at night. We want to try to you know, reduce all that overhead exposure. You can get these amber bulbs to use, which are a little bit softer and um, instead of those bright LED lights. The other thing that you want to do is really wear a sleep mask when you're sleeping, because if we're getting any light in our eyes during sleep, again, that's going to shut down our melatonin production. And, and that's also true of our bedrooms. If we're in bedrooms where there's a lot of light, um, again, that will shut down our melatonin production. We also have receptors in our skin. So any of that light that's hitting our eyes or our skin will reduce our melatonin and reduce the, the, that you know, benefit of really good sleep. Um, and also you really wanna try to finish dinner before the sun sets. And I know this is not a popular thing to say, especially in the winter, I know it's very difficult. Um, but if we remember that every function in our body is on a timer, including digestion, you know, when the sun goes down, our digestive enzymes are lower. So we're not meant to use up energy to digest our food at night. And that's why when we eat too late, we can get heartburn or indigestion and it makes it a little bit harder to sleep. And again, our bodies are not meant to use up all of our energy digesting. We need to use our energy to rest and repair the body. And last, um, if you do wake up before sunrise, uh, you wanna wear these blue light blockers, again, these night blockers before sunrise because you don't want this, the first signal of light to be those artificial lights that you're turning on in your house. So when I wake up before sunrise, I, I put these on and I do everything I need to do before sunrise in my house. And then when the sun comes up, I open my sun window and I take them off, I get my morning light exposure and then I start my day. So next is Wi-Fi. 
Now remember that Wi-Fi signals are part of that non-native spectrum of light. And Wi-Fi signals are essentially microwave signals. So we're, we're essentially surrounded by this microwave radiation at all times. And Wi-Fi signals, and I kept saying it throughout this talk, that Wi-Fi signals dehydrate our cells. And I'm not going to get into the specifics of how that happens, but just know that it dehydrates our cells. Um, Wi-Fi blocks our melatonin and creates cellular, um, blocks our ability to repair our cells. And Wi-Fi damages our mitochondria. And, and we know how important our mitochondrial health is to our bodies. Um, Wi-Fi will also damage our brain tissue and Wi-Fi has been linked to cancer. Now, how can we mitigate some of these harmful signals? Now, I know we can't avoid them. We're surrounded by Wi-Fi at all times, but we can try to make our homes, especially our bedrooms, as safe as we can. So we can turn off our Wi-Fi routers at night, uh, again, which may not be that easy, but it is something that can be very helpful. Um, we can, if we're home on computers, we can use ethernet cables to plug in so that we're hardwired and we're not using Wi-Fi to use our computers. And we also wanna unplug our unused electronics. Now, I didn't get into this too much, but it is interesting to note that when electronics are not in use and they're plugged in, they're still generating these electrical and magnetic signals and these fields that can also be damaging to our cells. And we also wanna make sure we're putting our phones on airplane mode when they're not in use. So again, we're not exposed to that Wi-Fi. And we also wanna be really careful with AirPods. So I know that people love their AirPods, and, but just think about it, you're literally putting this microwave radiation or this non-native radiation directly into your brain. And also we wanna try not to put our phone in our pockets or on us because we know, again, we know there's this, there's this link to cancer and the closer these signals are to our body, the more radiation we're absorbing. Now, this is also true with tech wearables. Um, I know that Apple watches are great. And again, I know I'm, I'm, people will not like this message, but they're touching the skin and they're constantly releasing these Wi-Fi signals into our bodies and you're absorbing them directly into the body. So it's really not good for us. And finally, you don't wanna sleep near a phone or a tablet because you don't want your brain to be exposed to this Wi-Fi radiation while we're sleeping, which is the time when we're, we're supposed to be repairing our bodies. So next is grounding. I love grounding. Um, so remember that I said that electrons come from the sun, from food and from water and from the earth. So the earth is, has an unlimited supply of electrons. And when we expose our bare skin to the surface of the earth, we absorb electrons instantly. And that's free energy. I mean, it's, it's negative ions, it's battery power, it's, it's voltage. And it's why we feel so good when we're at the beach and we have our feet on that wet sand or in the ocean, we're absorbing electrons. And remember that the more electrons we have, the more power we have to work well. Now, you don't have to spend hours at the beach with bare feet in the sand to get these electrons. There are many ways to get electrons. So we need to put either our hands our feet or our bare skin to different surfaces of the earth. Now, it's not just the, the, the earth, it's, it's grass, it's wet sand and oceans and lakes, but there are also other surfaces that are conductive. Um, there's concrete patios, like brick patios. There's metal poles that are attached to the ground like stop signs. And even water that's connected to pipes like our bathtubs can ground us. You can even touch a leaf or, or flower petals that are attached to the earth, or you can touch moss on trees and you can get electrons that way through your hands. And when you're washing dishes, that water is grounded because it's coming out of a pipe that's connected to the earth or the ground. And again, same with the bathtub. So the water that's touching the drain is actually grounded because the drain is connected to the pipes that are in the ground. Um, so I just find it, uh, it's, I think it's a lot of fun to think of all the ways we can gather these electrons from the earth. And it's also helpful to ground when we're getting that morning sunshine, it, it makes it even better. Now, there are some grounding tools that you can use indoors that they sell, but you just have to be careful with some of them because some of them can, can absorb this dirty electricity because they're plugged into our own electrical system in the house. And again, I'm not going to get into all of that, but some of them may not be as helpful. So again, we wanna plug into the earth and we wanna charge our body's batteries with electrons that come from the earth. So I've made a point not to discuss food, but this will be the only exception. So DHA is really important since it makes up our cell membranes, especially in the eyes. And uh, DHA is an omega-3 fatty acid. 
And we need these healthy cell membranes to absorb the sun, and that's what creates the electricity that we need for energy. And most of us are lacking in DHA. So DHA is found mostly in seafood, but it's also found in grass-fed animal meats. And we wanna to try to eat about four servings of seafood per week. We also wanna be careful with fish oil supplements because a lot of them are rancid and they're in the wrong form that makes it really difficult to absorb. And unfortunately, vegans cannot get DHA from vegetable sources, or they can't, really can't be absorbed that way. And without an adequate level of DHA, all of this circadian stuff really will not work properly, especially in our eyes. Next is red light and infrared light therapy. So since it can be difficult to spend hours outside during the day, most of us are significantly deficient in red light and infrared light. So in some cases, it might be helpful to actually supplement red light and infrared light. And we can do this with these at-home therapy boxes. And some are better than others. And again, I'm not going to get into which ones are the best right now, but I just want you to know that there is a ton of research around this photobiomodulation, which is red light and infrared light therapy. And here's just a list of some of the benefits. And again, I'm not going to read every single one, but you can see how helpful this therapy is. It's, it's for our energy and cellular repair. Now, athletes really um, love red light because it can be helpful with recovery from injuries and actually can improve athletic performance. Um, this also expands our hydration. And remember how important that exclusion zone water is for our body. And this therapy will give us, give us our battery power. Red light and infrared therapy can also be combined with sauna, which has even more benefits. And remember that red light is the antidote to that blue light toxicity, and it literally powers up our mitochondria. Now, usually a 20 minute dose is sufficient, but this does vary. And again, I, I'm not going to get into specifics right now, um, but just know that there are really many ways to do this to get the most benefit. So last is cold thermogenesis. Now, this is interesting. Um, most people don't like this very much because we really don't like to get cold but there are so many benefits to getting cold. Now, cold thermogenesis, it forces our mitochondria to release its own infrared heat or infrared light because it has to keep us warm. And remember that infrared heat will increase that exclusion zone or that gel water around our cells. And infrared heat will also increase that electron flow through the mitochondria. So um, cold thermogenesis will help us to burn body fat Again, it improves that electron flow through the mitochondria, which increases our energy. And again, I'm not suggesting that we jump into a 55 degree lake or, or like a tub full of ice for 20 minutes. You really have to start slowly because this can be a stressor if it's not done properly. So what you can do to start slowly is um, you can dunk your head in ice water you know, to, to start. Um, you can take a cool bath for a few minutes and then you wanna start building up tolerance and then eventually you can take these ice baths or cold plunges and get those benefits. But, but I really wanna stress again that you have to start slowly um, for it to be most beneficial. And again, we really are meant to be in sync with nature. So we have the seasons of, you know, when it's winter, most of us never get cold. We spend most of our time inside in like 70 degree heat. So our bodies are not exposed to the temperatures that we are designed to be exposed to. So cold thermogenesis can be really helpful to just help improve the health of our mitochondria and help improve our overall health. So in summary, our bodies are wired for sunlight through our eyes and our skin. And our modern world has taken us away from that natural rhythm of the sun and the earth. And remember that our cells are powered by sunlight and we really cannot live without it no matter how well we try to eat and exercise. Um, we're electrical light beings, and most of our health issues do stem from being out of sync with nature. And many of those eye diseases are actually made worse by our poor circadian rhythm, low melatonin, low vitamin D, cellular dehydration, and mitochondrial dysfunction. And when we are in sync with nature, and when we're in sync with that natural rhythm of the day and the night, we can optimize our health. And we can use some of these simple tools to help keep our bodies in sync with nature the way we were designed to be, and we can improve our health. So remember that full spectrum sunlight is a nutrient, and we wanna ask ourselves, how is our light diet? So over the past few years, I have started to incorporate these principles with patients in practice. 
And you know, I try to educate as many patients as possible about these quantum principles, but I obviously don't have that much time to go over everything with patients. So I do offer this starting point and then a general overview and some basic tips. So you know, not everyone is ready to hear this message, but there are many patients who have resonated with this information and they have made some changes in their own lives. So I have noticed some interesting things so far. Um, first, dry eyes have absolutely improved. So people who have incorporated these principles really don't feel the need to use their artificial tears all day. And even headaches that are related to dry eyes and computer use have also improved. Now, myopia is definitely worse in people who are on their phones all day and night, without a doubt. Um, but I have noticed some stabilization in people who have really incorporated these quantum principles in their lives. Cataracts, um, I'm not sure. I don't have enough information yet to tell if cataracts really have stabilized, um, but I do know that cataracts are much worse in people with poor quantum health. And as for floaters, um, I actually have not noticed a change. However, people may say that they don't see them anymore, but I think it's just that they don't notice them as much because they do tend to sink, even though I still see them in the vitreous. And with macular degeneration, um, this is difficult because most of these patients are really afraid to get sun because they've been told that UV light is the actual cause for macular degeneration. And I hope you've seen that that's not always the case. And again, this is definitely worse in people with this poor quantum health and once there's scar tissue, I, I haven't seen any improvements. And I have noticed that glaucoma does seem to progress faster in, in patients with poor sleep habits, like people who are night shift workers and people who have sleep apnea. And most glaucoma patients really don't sleep well. So if you start asking those questions, you'll realize that that's what's happening. And again, nerve damage really is not reversible. Now, overall, systemic diseases, um, people feel better overall uh, when they start really incorporating these foundational quantum principles in their lives. Overall, since systemic health feels better and eyes are connected to the body. So I find this really promising. So I'm really excited to see what happens, you know, as more and more people start to learn about these principles and continue to incorporate them into their lives, preferably before these eye diseases and health issues occur. So this is a picture of me with my family wearing our night blue light blockers. And this was years ago, this is from 2018. So my kids are teenagers now and they get really annoyed at me for showing this picture to practically every patient when I talk about night blue light blockers because this is a lock screen on my phone, <laughs> but I love it. Um, this was the beginning of our journey into the quantum world and I will not turn back. So thank you so much for listening. Um, this presentation really just covered the basics and I do look forward to sharing additional information in the future. And if you have any questions or you want to reach out, I did list my email here on the slide and you can also find me on uh, my YouTube channel and on Instagram so far, thank you. And these are the references that I use. As you can see, there's a ton of research and so much more.